Good afternoon. Well, I think we'll get started. I expect some more stragglers. Um, I'm Marguerite Sullivan, the Senior Director of the Center of International Media Assistance here at NED. And our discussion today is the role of media development in democratic transitions, the case of South Africa. And we're going to be talking about Southern Africa media. Our panel is going to be moderated by Reed Kramer. And Reed is the founder and CEO of All Africa Global Media, which publishes allafrica.com. However, its first name was the Africa um, News Service, and he started that in the mid-70s. So Reed has been at this for a very, very long time. I'm going to turn it over to you, Reed. But first, let me say, for anyone tweeting, please use the hashtag SEMA events. It's also listed in the programs. Thank you. Thank you, Marguerite. We have the makings of a very interesting session here. The panelists, as you've no doubt discovered, if you've had a look at the, your, their biographies, bring a rich uh, history. We also have people in the, in the room uh, with rich histories, like Simon Barber, who's been a reporter uh, at, in South Africa and now here in Washington for a long time, uh, knows the subject well. We have, I'm sure, many young people eager to learn, like the two interns that are here from all Africa who will be tweeting for us, I'm glad to say. So I, I, I think we're, we're off to a good start here. And uh, I think I'll hope let uh, Libby come on and talk about her report and then come back and, and engage the, the panel as soon as she has finished. So I think for that purpose, uh, we need to move down so that we can look up at the screen. So here we go. Libby, you can go ahead. I'm okay. Not sure. Okay. I wasn't sure. <laughs> um, um, good afternoon to everyone there, and it's a good evening here. Um, before I start, I want to thank SEMA and the NED, both for this event, but also for commissioning this report. Um, the issues discussed in the report and raised are things I deal with all the time in my work, but it's very rare that we get, it, get the time to research, reflect, and grapple with the issues around these in such a holistic way um, and to be able to think for ourselves of a more comprehensive um, way of thinking about them all. I was asked essentially by SEMA to answer two key questions. Um, what is the state of freedom of the media in South Africa in comparison to the situation that there was under apartheid? And then the second one was what role in particular US development agencies have played in fostering the freedom that we dreamt of? Um, so the first one, is South Africa's much-touted best practice model of freedom of the media in danger? There is no simplistic answer to that. You can say yes, no, maybe. And I think the answer is similar to probably anywhere else in the world to this question. Things are inevitably more nuanced, and the threats to people's rights to a choice of insightful, incisive journalism and analysis that we all probably dream of, do not necessarily come from governments. The signing in of a constitution in South Africa that emphasized the right to equality and dignity of all of us does not mean that we are no longer 20 years later haunted by a legacy of institutionalized inequality. And South Africa is one of the most unequal societies in the world. Equally, the right to freedom of expression and to a free media um, does not immediately come in with the signing of, of into of, with, the, with that right being expressed in our constitution. That right does not undo a very deep distrust, resentment, and bitterness against the media, given it's that most of it played a very complicit role in bolstering apartheid. 
nor did it, does it magically undo the fact that media, inevitably under apartheid, was skewed towards a minority white urban privileged grouping. But the Constitution does make a huge difference. It means that we now, as one of the commentators that I've quoted in the report, Anton Harbour says, we ha can have, without fear of arrest or being shut down, heated and very noisy debates about what does freedom of expression and freedom of the media mean in relation to a whole lot of the other rights that are in our Constitution. And as he states, thank goodness it is so noisy. Worst would be silence. That noise is democracy at work. So some of the findings when I reflected on this issue where we are now, we do have threats against media freedom. We do have politicians that inevitably will try and turn any criticism of them by um, trying to turn it onto the media and blaming them for their lack of um, transformation. But our constitution does protect us. We have several landmark court judgments in recent years ones that have compelled private companies to give access to information because our public access to information acts cover both government and the private sector. We have recently had one um, judgment in a court that's protected journalist sources and said that that is an issue that is critical to everyone's freedom of expression. Um, but there is also currently a bill that's, way, that's gone, been sent by our parliament to the president to sign that has been much criticised. It deals with the protection of state information. And it has been said that it has been accused of taking us back to an apartheid era type censorship. That, of course, is disputed. But if he does sign it into law, there is no doubt it will land up at our constitutional court. And judging from the previous judgments, if it does threaten freedom of expression unjustifiably, it will be sent back to Parliament and struck out. The other big, big threat, though, in South Africa is over-concentration of the media, and in particular the print media, which has not transformed much since the days of apartheid. A US study that is cited in the report done by Columbia University finds that South African media is one of the most concentrated in the world. On some measurements, it is the most concentrated in the world, second with Egypt following us. The same time as elsewhere, cuts in editorial budgets to increase profits and an ever increasingly commercial media means that in a way we're in danger of conformity of opinion and of benignness. Um, all of that has major implications for our access to, to in-depth information. That over-concentration leads us to the next question. What role does me has funding by development agencies had in our transition? In some ways, especially the print media, is perhaps sadly, 20 years after our first democratic election, less diverse than it was under apartheid. We had a range of foreign-funded, anti-establishment, independent newspapers, though of course nothing but state broadcasting at the time. Only one of those newspapers has survived um, the cutback in funding. They all survived repeated attempts by the apartheid government against them to silence them and their journalists and editors being detained and arrested. Two of the journals that were published at that time are still operating. But those are niche publications, and they thus have access to funding other than that explicitly targeting the media. One focuses on gender issues and the other focuses on labor issues. This is not peculiar to media in South Africa, the cutbacks in funding. Many other non-governmental agencies and independent voices, and one of our think tanks, IDASA, closed down at the beginning of this year due to cutbacks in funding. They've suffered because now that we've got democracy, we're no longer a priority. Other countries have it worse. We're also categorized as a middle-income country, and that's not seen as being in such dire need as elsewhere. And, of course, the global economic downturn and the cutback in funds that are generally available has affected us as well. I did look and try and find out more and give, be able to give more statistical information on, on media funding in South Africa. But like studies that are quoted in the paper that are about media funding around the world in general, in Europe and elsewhere, what the... the Inability to find much um, detailed information is not unusual to South Africa. It seems to be something that's quite common for the sector itself. 
Key findings in that regard. It was very, very difficult to track what funding there has been to the media in South Africa. Not only little, difficult to track over a number of years, but difficult even to track how much money de development aid came in for media in South Africa last year. Only one of the development agencies from the US that I found had a specific fund that targeted the media. That was the Open Society Foundation of South Africa, which is linked to the Soros Network. So the figures and information in the report are not definitive, and they are more indicative of trends. Um, I did trawl through lots and lots of information from other funders, but because they don't have a specific media category, it would I had to try and extract from their more general reports what was for media. And of course then, look, sometimes it would say it was a media-related fund, but it would be going to an NGO, and you're not sure if it was about ensuring there was journalism or if it was public going to be finding publicity material for that NGO itself. Um, and even then, the information on funding of the media by the Open Society Foundation was not easy to track down. I had to go through all of their annual reports. It wasn't easily accessible on their website. And I had to look through years of annual reports to extract the information that is in charts in that table. Other entities, and I want to mention Atlantic Philanthropies here, because theirs is the most transparent and easy to find information of any of those that I looked at. And they have provided, although they do not have a separate media category, they have provided invaluable support to some media organizations. For example, they've included, they have been a core funder of an independent news agency that focuses on health and has exposed a number of, um, yeah, done investigative reporting into the inadequacy of healthcare in South Africa and the inequality that there still is in access to healthcare. But that comes under their programs for health or so social justice. It doesn't come, a, it's not specially saying we will fund media in and of itself. And while we do need what I'm calling niche media, we also need good journalism across all media and platforms that doesn't only focus on a specific um, issue. But while that shortage of information, of comprehensive information, makes it difficult to reach any conclusive findings about being able to judge the overall impact of that development aid. It is clear from the study, I think, that the few cases in which there has been dedicated, targeted support for quality news content has contributed to the development of islands of investigative journalism excellence in this country. And we do have some wonderful examples of great investigative journalism. This, in turn, has ensured that those with economic or political power are held to account, and it's drawn attention to ongoing struggles for social justice. So it does contribute to the other agendas of some of the development agencies. That one of the, challenge, the other findings that one of the challenges in media funding, not only in South Africa but around the world, but the, those that are applying for funding, repeated to me is how impossible and difficult it is to measure the impact of what they do in the way that funders want. It's not direct. This perhaps, therefore, has led to the fact that in South Africa, like elsewhere, there tends to be a trend, as one of the people interviewed said, of by development agencies to focus on what they call the periphery, training, training on specific issues, like training on election coverage, training on health, training on social justice. And sometimes he said that is based on funders' needs and their particular programs and what they want to be funding, rather than a measurable demand or need for that. I now want to, in ending off, I want to start looking at a story that appeared here, a commentary that appeared here this week, but that in a, in a way leads on to looking at the region, which some of the other speakers are speaking about. And uh, in a commentary on an online, very small publication called The Daily Maverick here, um, a journalist who covers a lot of the African continents, Simon Allison, stated that one of the dangers to African media in generally, and therefore to society and democracy, is the lack of funding of quality journalism. He quoted an African writer, Hunua Ahib, um, uh, quoting a Nigerian proverb. The proverb says that until the lions learn to write, the story of the hunt will always be told by the hunters. 
What he was saying is that when you travel through Africa, most of the stories about our own countries and our neighbors come from AFP, come from Reuters, who inevitably are targeting different audiences than the one in those own countries. And what he states, I'm going to quote from him directly, because in a way, it sums up what I found in my research. An even more direct solution to all of those often touted uh, is to plug the funding gap that plays such a big role in lowering quality of the media. There are some excellent publications across Africa which could do wonders with slightly inflated budgets. So maybe the donors that are happy to splash the cash on endless conferences and capacity building workshops should consider funding media instead. I'd like to add on to what he's saying, because I think that there's a bigger debate about that as well. Isn't that looking to get funding for quality journalism, we also have to find ways and develop models to make sure that such donor-funded media is also independent of the development agencies that fund them, and that is, is perceived to be independent from them by those that read and listen to it, and therefore not targeted as reflecting foreign agendas. That will make it credible to its audiences. Um, the, the journalist that I quoted mentioned that one of the real, one of the major um, one of the, we've got a, the Mail and Guardian is the one that survived the paper that survived it used to then be called the Weekly Mail it was one of the few the only anti-apartheid newspaper that survived our transition to democracy and it has in the last few years set up a dedicated investigative journalism unit that is called Amabongani which means dung beetle in South Africa, so similar to the notion of a muckraker. It is totally donor funded, but as they state on their website, they try and make sure that they get donations from a multiplicity of funders. And they have decided that they will not accept government or corporate funding or funding for any specific stories that they need to protect their independence. And I think that debate around how we can the need to actually fund what is very expensive, investigative journalism and quality journalism in these countries, um, but protect them, not only, not only protect their independence, but protect the perception of their independence is important. I, there's no doubt that the need for independent, robust news media, and I think this is the lesson from South Africa, and for advocacy organizations that advocate and continue to push for freedom of expression, that does not diminish with the introduction of a vote for everyone or the introduction of democracy. It is, in a way, rather absolutely critical to getting an understanding by society about what those rights mean to all of us and entrenching that democracy. It's not the time to cut funding when we've just, um, because there is now a Bill of Rights. Thank you. there for us to digest and talk about. I'll say a bit about each of the panelists that are here and then engage them in this conversation. I think my main role here is as a timekeeper, which is a, always a popular job. Fortunately, I've known all these panelists for so many years that I'm sure they'll forgive me if I pull, uh, pull the cord on their mics, which I've been instructed sort of to do, figuratively, but I don't think it'll be necessary. Marguerite mentioned uh, my role at All Africa Global Media. Many of you are familiar with our website, allafrica.com. I'm one of three co-founders of All Africa. My, uh, to my left is another co-founder, Amadou Matarba. We began working together in the, in, the, uh, in the 90s, before there was an All Africa, creating a website <clears throat> to give voice to African media um, mostly outside Africa because of lack of connectivity on the continent at the time, to make sure that media being produced in Africa could be accessed uh, globally. And uh, Matar, as we call him at All Africa, um, was at the time at the Pan-African News Agency. So together with Pana and All Africa, we recruited newspapers being published across Africa figured out ways to get them uh, electronically delivered and started 
uh, producing uh, electronic 24-hour news uploads that people could access and made a deal with African media that we would do a revenue share based on whatever revenue could be generated. And essentially, that's what we still do at All Africa Today, although we have many, many more newspaper sources and many more sources elsewhere. Matar wears another hat besides his role as chair at All Africa. He is the chief executive officer, really the driving force of the, at the African Media Initiative. We'll have to skim to say a little bit more about that. Some of those you who were here when he spoke before a couple of years ago and, and who have uh, come across AMI and the African Media Leaders Forum, uh, which happens every year, uh, know something about the work. But it's, a, it's an organization set up to support and strengthen media across Africa. All of us up here uh, work on Africa broadly, Pan-African. Uh, we have a Pan-African focus, so I'm sure the discussion today will, will shift between South Africa, the topic of the report, and, and more generally, uh, media uh, issues and challenges across the continent. Dave uh, Peterson is a reformed journalist, but uh, most of us have known him uh, in his current role, which he's been in since 1988 at, at this institution where we sit today, the National Endowment for Democracy, where he's uh, responsible for the program to identify and assist NGOs across Africa working for democracy, human rights, free press, justice, and peace. And uh, we'll, we'll have him engage on some of those issues that, where, where that impact uh, media in, uh, in a broader sense. And Jerry Eddings, who I knew first as foreign correspondent based in South Africa for the Baltimore Sun, has done a number of things since then. She went to World, U.S. News and World Report from there. She ran the, the, uh, the center in, in South Africa that many of you may have encountered uh, for a while. And now she's here in Washington at the International Center for Journalists and uh, with a wealth of experience in South Africa but across the continent uh, on, on media and supporting media, which she's done for, for very many years. So I'll, I'll throw, go to Dave first, because that's the way it's listed here. I'm not picking on you, David. And uh, ask you to say a couple of things. I thought that Libya's emphasis on the role, the importance of the Constitution in South Africa was something that uh, we would all agree with. And uh, we all know that in view the the press media in Africa as, in, as a key ingredient for building and strengthening democracy. Democratic institutions are much younger in, in Africa than, than they are here and in some other countries for reasons we all know. And so the, uh, the press often has to play the role that, that, uh, that other uh, institutions play here. Um, but the South Africa, in 1994 and 95 came up with a very strong constitution and press freedom is enshrined in that constitution. So as we look at 20 years after that, as we look at South Africa and the role of the press and the issues that are being confronted there, I'd like you to, to, to bring the constitution into whatever else you want to say about that today. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Reed. Uh, uh, I will have a few things to say about uh, constitutions in uh, some other countries in Southern Africa. Uh, they are important in terms of press freedom. Um, um, and I also want to say it's a great honor to uh, sit on the uh, table with you and uh, Amadou and, and, and Jerry. You're all, uh, I think, uh, very uh, great uh, journalists, uh, uh, journalism review. Uh, I don't think it lasted for more than a couple of years, but uh, uh, I think that's an example of the kind of uh, project that we were doing in uh, South Africa in those days. <clears throat> um, I remember very well, as described in uh, Libby's report too, uh, when I was working for another organization called uh, Project South Africa up in New York, I uh, had a subscription to the Weekly Mail. And uh, it was really quite electrifying uh, getting that uh, issue uh, 
that was almost half covered with uh, these black uh, these black sensor marks, uh, and they continued, uh, you know, showing how they were being censored uh, for several issues after that. Uh, but uh, you know that was, uh, I think, typical of the uh, media in those days. Uh, there was uh, also a little bookshop uh, near uh, Witz University. Uh, some people, I can't remember the name of it now, but uh, you could get all kinds of uh, interesting publications there, like Work in Progress, the South Africa Labor Bulletin, Samstan, uh, The New Nation. Um, you know, those were very heady days. Um, and I have no doubt that uh, the independent press uh, really helped to inform and shape uh, South Africa's democratic movement at the time. And one can still find good journalism in uh, South Africa, um, but it really doesn't seem to have the same edge uh, that it used to. It's, it's no longer so subversive, I guess you might say. Uh, I have to agree with Anton Harbour, uh, as Olivia reports, uh, that the uh, press environment now is not nearly as uh, repressive as it was in the days of apartheid. Uh, of course, this doesn't mean that um, it's not important to uh, continue to defend and expand uh, with all due tenacity, uh, the gains that have been made. Um, I think uh, it's also worth noting that, uh, you know, compared to uh, the apartheid days, uh, the FM radio and community radio was really just uh, getting off the ground. Uh, and uh, obviously, the internet and social media was a long ways off. And that certainly, I think, changed the media uh, environment in, in South Africa. <clears throat> But uh, Ned was also experimenting with a lot of other uh, press projects uh, across the region at that time. Uh, in 1992, we uh, made a grant to a little newspaper called the Malawi Democrat. It was the only independent newspaper in Malawi at the time. Uh, we supported um, civic education supplements in two Zambian newspapers in the early 90s. Uh, we helped to launch a newspaper called Dimosh in Mozambique in 1993. Um, we supported uh, a little magazine called uh, Horizon in Zimbabwe uh, in 1995 and uh, did some journalist training uh, with the Willie Musarua Trust. Um, and in uh, Botswana, uh, we uh, made a grant to the Megiwa Dikdang uh, newspaper. Uh, and in Tanzania, a little newspaper called The Family Mirror. Uh, these were all, you know, uh, very early days for uh, the independent press in Africa. <clears throat> But um, shortly after South Africa's 1994 elections, we started winding down our South Africa program uh, for many of the reasons that were cited in uh, Libby's report. Uh, South Africa seemed to be quickly consolidating its democracy and had significant internal resources uh, to support uh, democratic civil society, including the press, uh, especially compared to other parts of Africa. Uh, we were reluctant, I think, to pick and choose among the many good publications and good projects, um, you know, not wanting really to be identified with any particular editorial or, or political position. Um, I, I would um, take issue with uh, the report uh, suggesting that uh, measuring impact was a concern of ours. Uh, I think uh, measuring impact is always a problem uh, in the democracy uh, promotion uh, business, whether it's media or civil society. Uh, I think actually, in some ways, media is a lot easier to measure in terms of impact than uh, some of the other kinds of programs that we support. Uh, you know, you can look at the size of a publication's uh, circulation, uh, reader's responses, the general content and quality of the publication. Uh, many other tangible factors that you don't always find in other kinds of uh, uh, programs. Uh, currently, uh, NED is supporting media in only two uh, southern African countries, uh, Zimbabwe and Angola. Uh, we've regarded most of the rest of the re subregion uh, as relatively stable and democratic. Uh, obviously, there are problems in a lot of the countries. Um, I should add uh, here, actually, in the case of Swaziland, uh, we haven't done any media projects, uh, but uh, that would qualify as a country that's uh, democratically challenged, you might say. Uh, uh, in the um, case of Zimbabwe, uh, my assessment has been that there actually are considerable resources uh, going to support uh, the media. Uh, 
you know, there's uh, the Zimbabwe newspaper, for example, uh, uh, Radio Voice of the People, uh, Radio Dialogue Trust. Uh, these are all receiving pretty big uh, funding uh, that supported uh, some of those, uh, as well as some projects with the Media Institute of South Africa, uh, MISA, which I think does a lot of good work in the subregion, uh, and uh, the Zimbabwe uh, Union of Journalists, uh, currently, which is doing an uh, interesting project of citizens' journalism. Uh, also, I should say, uh, through the Solidarity Center, uh, the endowment supported uh, the um, Zimbabwe Congress of Trade Unions uh, newspaper, uh, The Worker, uh, which uh, for a while was the only independent newspaper in Zimbabwe. Uh, for me, uh, the media environment in Zimbabwe uh, today feels a lot like uh, South Africa back in the apartheid years. Uh, there's um, actually quite a bit of independent information and criticism of the government uh, that one can encounter in the country, both uh, in the press and the broadcast media. Um, uh, I just saw last week uh, a new independent television, television station uh, has been established. It's actually, as uh, Jerry was reminding me, uh, based outside of Zimbabwe and broadcasting into the country. Uh, but uh, there's also uh, some uh, independent radio stations that have been opened up in uh, Zimbabwe. Uh, and, and so there's uh, significantly more uh, media space uh, than there has been for a long time. Uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, the government, uh, controlled by ZANU-PF, uh, still does dominate uh, the media. Uh, there was a very interesting uh, uh, study that was done uh, some uh, years ago by the Mass Public Opinion Institute, which I think documented rather convincingly uh, that uh, ZANU-PF's uh, success in the rural areas of Zimbabwe was largely due to its dominance uh, of uh, the airwaves. Um, you know, there have been uh, a lot of reforms uh, in Zimbabwe that have been uh, proposed uh, coming along with the um, global political agreement. Uh, you know, there's been calls to repeal the Access to Information and Protection of Privacy Act, uh, the Broadcasting Services Act, the Public Order and Security Act, uh, and um, uh, the criminal law, which deals with defamation. Uh, there's not uh, been a lot of progress uh, on any of that, uh, but uh, I think uh, they will be uh, very important. Um, as Reed was asking about the Constitution, uh, in fact, uh, we had a conference here just a couple days ago on Zimbabwe, uh, and uh, the president of the uh, journalist union there was uh, uh, suggesting that uh, there is a lot of uh, potential uh, that the new Constitution in Zimbabwe will open up uh, the media finally. Uh, there's a provision in there for a Freedom of Information Act and um, uh, some other reforms that, uh, if implemented, uh, you know, could uh, help to open up the media in Zimbabwe. Uh, something else, I think, of course, as I mentioned in the case of South Africa, uh, to note in the case of Zimbabwe is uh, the use of uh, ICT. Uh, there are now three million Zimbabweans that have access to satellite TV, so they get that uh, kind of information from outside. There's nine million Zimbabweans uh, that have uh, mobile phones, uh, and so uh, that's been used uh, quite a lot for um, civic education purposes uh, in the uh, upcoming elections. Uh, I also found it very interesting uh, looking at the uh, MISA reports that uh, attacks against the press have actually declined quite a bit in the last few years. Uh, you know, there's still some uh, problems. It was uh, kind of striking to me, uh, again, uh, just a, a few weeks back, uh, that uh, some MDC uh, partisans had attacked some journalists. Uh, you know, so it's not always coming uh, from uh, ZANU-PF, uh, but, um, uh, you know, nevertheless, uh, it's not as bad as uh, what you might think and what has been in the past in Zimbabwe. Uh, I think the vigor of the political discourse in Zimbabwe today really owes a lot uh, to the independent uh, media and expansion of it. Uh, just quickly, in the case of Angola, uh, you know, there's very little uh, space for independent media, I think. Uh, uh, some years ago, we supported Radio Ecclesia. Uh, and uh, currently, the only media project we have really is uh, something called Maka Angola, 
uh, which is an independent news website uh, run by the well-known uh, journalist and human rights activist uh, Rafael Marques. Um, I think Maca Angola does some very impressive uh, muckraking, exposing government corruption and human rights abuses uh, in the expanding political space. Um, uh, you know, the remainder of the uh, media in Angola, radio and print press, has largely been stifled, uh, most often simply uh, co-opted by the government, which has enormous financial resources. Uh, but the blogosphere uh, really seems to be filling the void. You've got uh, these rappers and uh, YouTube videos that uh, are really uh, increasingly challenging the authorities. Um, so finally, um, you know, given this modest experience with uh, the media in Southern Africa, uh, what trends and lessons would I draw? Um, again, uh, just looking at some of the MISA uh, reports uh, on Southern Africa, uh, I think there are a lot of uh, similar uh, concerns that Libya raises that are preoccupations in some other Southern African countries. Uh, that includes the uh, continued use of colonial era uh, press laws and restrictions. Uh, uh, also, of course, the resistance of many governments to freedom of information bills, problems with financial so, uh, sustainability, uh, you know, uh, a sort of overabundance of certain kinds of training and a lack of training in other things. Uh, you know, from a, a small donor's perspective, which I would consider the endowment to be a relatively uh, small donor uh, uh, in this field, uh, it's difficult to support media. Uh, uh, very often, there are very large-scale uh, projects. Uh, you know, uh, shortwave radio in particular is very expensive. Um, you know, the printing press uh, tends to reach only small, relatively elite uh, audiences. Um, the internet and social media, on the other hand, uh, do seem to be making huge inroads. Uh, platforms such as uh, Ushahidi uh, are uh, being increasingly used. Um, as um, uh, you know, from our perspective, I would say, uh, however, that the, the uh, focus on media uh, is not simply a means of increasing accountability and improving service, service delivery, uh, as uh, is kind of recommended, I think, in Libby's report. Um, uh, I would regard uh, press freedom as an intrinsic value, uh, just like democracy. Uh, citizens should be free to criticize their government or speak about whatever they like, not just for instrumental reasons, uh, not just because it may provide economic benefits, uh, but because freedom of speech and the press is a fundamental human right, um, a fundamental democratic right. Uh, without freedom of the press, there can be no democracy. And I really can't think of an exception to that. Thank you. Amadou, uh, you work with media all over the continent. And I wondered if you could share with us where you see um, strengths and similarities with uh, with what you know about South Africa and what's covered in the report, and where you see uh, striking differences. Thank you, Reid. Um, well, you know, first and foremost, thank you. Margaret and all the team for inviting me back here. I think I was here about a couple of years back when we were still just at the beginning of what is now African Media Initiative, so talking about what that may look like. Uh, so a couple of years back, obviously, you know, we can look at it and see all the errors and huge mistakes we have made, but also the tremendous and great, you know, successes, you know, we've an impact we actually have made uh, across the continent. And, and hopefully I'll have time to, to talk about that a little bit later. Uh, you know, but just commenting on what Libby was saying and also Dave mentioning, I think quite frankly, you know, when, when, when you look at around, around the continent, um, there's some sort of similarities more and more. Many countries around the continent are trying to change for the better their constitutions. I'm not talking about head of states who wake up and says, well, I need another term. Mm -hmm. You know, I need another year and tries to tweak the constitution. But if you have a fundamental overhaul of a constitution, like the Kenyans have done, and like in many countries they're discussing about, uh, you have more and more this Freedom of Information Act, which is more and more being seen as part of it. 
media and press freedom being also a part of it. Uh, as such, it becomes like something like fashionable. And of course, we have to be vigilant and careful about that. Uh, but fundamentally, I think you know, what's happening is there is that movement towards like saying, let's try to open up a little bit the space, although I 100% agree that in many countries, you still have colonial era types laws governing today's media. But wherever you have this change, you know, in the constitutions, it becomes a reality that, you know, showing uh, good face. Um, but while that happens, and we've seen that a lot in the work we do at the African Media Initiative, uh, when we engage with head of states and others uh, to try to open up the media, it's, you know, the question which comes more and more is, or what do we get in exchange? You know, if everything is a deal, then you've got to be prepared to answer that question. And you know, I suppose also that one of the reasons why they're asking that is somehow in the report, uh, Libby's report, you know, we talk a lot about the role of you know, foreign donors to the media in the countries. You know, many of these countries actually, even if they have an independent media which is growing, foreign donors giving directly to the media is actually a problem to that. And quite frankly, even to citizens, it starts being a problem directly. Foreign media, you know, uh, helping media houses to do reports. I can understand that. And I can understand that particularly in a context when, you know, those media houses to begin with, and I'm not very popular when I say this to my friends in the media, but you know, most of our media houses are not professional. I'm not just saying it. Here I say it everywhere on the continent. But I'm not just saying it. I'm saying it, but also trying to do something against that to get them a little bit more professional. Um, so there's a lot of ethics issues and leadership issues in the media. So if actually a donor, a foreign donor for that matter, funds directly the operations of the news organization, then they are seen as really being trumpeting the cause of those donors. Now, you know, you've got to find a way of, you know, dealing with these situations. One of the things we're doing at the African Media Initiative is to say, well, first and foremost, let's agree. Media is not the enemy. And of course, well, government is not necessarily the enemy. You know, sometimes they are. But there must be a platform through which we discuss. Then we put forward something we call the ethics and leadership guiding principles for the media owners in Africa. Now, of course, you know, when you think about it, many, and that's the case in South Africa, hence the concentration issue you have, many who are in the business of media, the owners, many of them are not journalists. They're totally not journalists, they're business people, something else. So hence, you know, this ethics problem you have with their involvement in news organizations within the newsrooms. And that creates a lot of issues. So we came forward with something we call leadership guiding principles, ethics leadership guiding principles for the media owners and operators, which basically describes what, um, how a media news organization should be operating from a governance perspective, but also from a disclosure perspective, which is very important. The, dis the, the ownership concentration you have in countries like South Africa or Kenya or others, at the end of the day, you cannot necessarily do anything against it if you are really preaching for freedom of information and open societies. I mean, you can't do anything against that if people try to hold on or create news organizations, even if they're not you know, journalists or have nothing to do with the media. What, on the other hand, you have to actually be pushing forward is the disclosure issue. If I am a citizen, I want to know that this news, this, uh, news organization, radio, TV, or whatever it is, is owned by, and then I know who. So when I read it, I have, you know, some lenses I can put, it, put on and then, you know, 
try to interpret a little bit. But if you don't know, then it becomes a problem. Uh, but also, you know, and it goes into details of a lot of other things, including pay, as a news organization, pay your journalists. Because if you pay them, then, you know, you reduce the corruption issue within the news organizations, which is widespread and huge. So, you know, there's a lot of issues surfaced in the report and surfaced by Libby. To a certain extent, you know, you find them throughout the continent, and I believe, I strongly believe it's the business of us who work in this space on the continent to try to find some solutions to, 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 to address them. And it's not always easy. Now, it puts the future of the media really into geopolitics if you don't solve it. Let me give you a couple of examples. Um, now, obviously, almost everybody got a voice today in Africa because of these devices, these cell phones. I'm not necessarily talking about smartphones. I'm talking also about feature phones. You know, when you're in the rural area, or wherever it is, you can actually participate in whatever national debate is happening as long as you have a cell phone. And in some countries, you have close to 100% coverage cell phone. So what happens is the news organizations are not professional. They end up relying on some people who are not journalists, not even pretending to be journalists. I just happen to be able to write on a blog or tweet or have a Facebook. And it's, you can notice it today in some countries where some people have more followers than established news organizations. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, that poses a problem in the long run because those people, too, can turn and become like, you know, quote unquote rogue. So I think there's a lot of things, there are, lot, there are a lot of things to be done in this media space. And obviously it has to start by the professional, those who work in this space, taking media seriously and then move from there. And I think there's a good movement which is starting. Well, you're not, you're not letting the media off the hook even as we try to defend it. Jerry, you have so much perspective uh, from the time you were based in South Africa as a reporter, from your years running the Freedom Forum Africa Media Center in Johannesburg, which focused on the whole continent, but was based there, and all the things you've done since, including ICJ. I'm really interested in anything you could say, uh, kicking off from Libby's report about both the strengths and vulnerabilities of, of uh, media in South Africa today and, and more broadly across the continent, if you, if you want to include any comments on that. Thank you, Reed. Um, a, lot of, a lot of really sort of important things have been said about media in South Africa and, and in the, around the continent. Um, I started with a very serious focus on South Africa when I was doing journalism rather than helping journalists around the continent. So I, I'll, I'll, I'll start there. Um, and, and some of it may repeat or reinforce what Libby has said and what Dave has said and, and what Amadou has said. Um, when I started working in South Africa with journalists and as a journalist, it was during the era when um, uh, journalists who were working for democracy or a democratic South Africa would very often find themselves in prison and that was the issue, whether or not you could, you could express yourself in, in that country without being uh, thrown in jail or, or beaten up or having something terrible happen to you. Uh, the first South African journalist that I was, was um, that I knew well uh, was Zwilaki Sisulu, the recently, uh, the late Zwilaki Sisulu, who at that time was uh, running a, um, a Catholic church-funded newspaper, a small, active, very activist newspaper, a very anti-apartheid newspaper. And, and when I met Zwilaki, and I think in the late 80s, he had recently been in prison. Uh, and uh, had been in prison for some months, uh, as his father had been in prison and his mother had been in prison, and almost anybody who worked for South for democracy in South Africa at that time had had been in, either in prison or or had fled the country. 
and and journalist uh, Zoilaki, uh, his 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 uh, his newspaper was was one of those that Libby referred to that no longer exists, but that was very instrumental at that time in helping to push South Africa keep 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 the voice of the people um, as part of the dialogue as, about South Africa. Uh, and, and people like Zoilaki were brave inside of the country. And then there were those who were brave outside of the country, but not putting their lives on the line every day. And, and there were those who were working um, for international media. And I think that that was an era when there were more South Africans uh, represented in international media writing for, uh, working for the BBC, for, for German television, as Amina Frenza, who's now at the SABC, was. At, for Swedish newspapers, as Sylvia Brown, who uh, is a private consultant now, it was. Uh, it was not possible. It was very, uh, it was very unlikely that you could do serious journalism that that expressed views um, up, that the government opposed without getting yourself in trouble. So, so yes, South Africa then is like Zimbabwe now, um, or other places on the continent now where journalists. Uh, can get themselves very much in, in jail or imprisoned. Um, South Africa, the media climate in South Africa now, though, is so very different. Uh, not only because uh, uh, there is sort of this vibrant and diverse media landscape on the continent, but also because there are these mega, very wealthy media houses uh, in South Africa that are probably wealthier than most of the media organizations and many of the media organizations in this country or, that are in Europe. and. Um, and I think therein lies uh, a very big difference between media in South Africa today and media in much of the rest of the continent. They struggle to survive. Uh, they have issues of, they have revenue issues, they have issues of sustainability that, that have to do with their own pre professionalism, like, like Amadou mentioned, but that also have to do with, uh, with the, the, their economies and, and other, other issues. But, but, uh, Across much of the continent, media is very much media organizations and media is very much in jeopardy still because um, because or media organizations um, teeter on the edge of a, of a financial um, disaster very often, uh, and that leads to some of the things that uh, that Amadou talked about sort of corrupt underpaid journalists, corruption, and all sorts of things that we we try to get away from. Uh, I, uh, I did start out as a journalist, and I have spent the last several years working with media development. And one of the things we do at the International C Center for Journalists is, is try to help jour journalism organizations and media organizations with issues of sustainability. We also look at human capacity issues, and we try to. We, we still do old-fashioned training of journalists, but, we, we, but more than that, we look at opportunities like uh, the, the new technological revolution and the, the increase in, in cell phone use. And it, I mean, it's, it, it, you, cell phones are ubiquitous across the continent. And, and trying to try to help find ways to take advantage of those changes to help, um, to, to help uh, media organizations sustain themselves so that they can be more professional. And what I, one thing that I should say is that a lot of the work that we do, ICFJ does on the continent, is not done in the way that Open Society does by sort of funding uh, media organizations or running a media, a media program, but we do it um, in collaboration with organizations on the continent. In fact, the organization that we collaborate most closely with in these efforts right now is Amadou's, the African Media Initiative, and uh, and we work uh, primarily through a program that we have called the Knight International Journalism Fellowships. Uh, we deploy people at places like Amadou's outfit to help push push, uh, push uh, initiatives that are designed to help the continent's media community uh, grow and thrive and improve um, uh, on, on any number of, of uh, in any number of areas but uh, but uh, but the issues in Zambia for instance where there are two government newspapers that are that are both both struggling and both dealing with with heavy government control um, uh, and we're one of them, I'm told, the circulation is now down to 10,000, which is practically nothing. Um, uh, I think that's the Times of Zambia, which is the main government newspaper, circulation of 10,000. Those, the issues of those newspapers are just totally, totally different than, than the issues in South Africa, which is, despite its 
challenges today with the secrecy law and and other others are it's it's just a different world as south africa often has been from from the rest of the continent you're going to bring libby back in yeah you can start i'll do it over here and okay <laughs> so we we're ready for questions. I believe we have microphones moving around, and you can direct your questions to Libby or anyone sitting up here. Marguerite, do you want to go first? Um, I wanted to ask if, if you could talk in a little bit more detail about the effect of digital media. I mean, um, and and maybe it would relate to the the, the challenge that um, Ami has. But continent wide, are we are you seeing any sort of a shift? <coughs> Like we have here, I mean, certainly it's a totally different environment, but everything is digital now and mobile. I mean, what are, you, what are you finding? Is that where people are getting their information? What about community radio? That's had a, played a huge role in South Africa and other countries. I mean, what, what is the dominant media and where do you see it going in 10 years? Thank you. Well, uh, I think, Margaret, anybody who wants to tell you where media would be in 10 years, don't believe them. <laughs> you know, that's, that's the principle. But, but, when you look at the continent today, and I'm sure Reed can comment on this too, there's more and more people getting news and information from their mobile devices. That's a fact. Reed can give you, I'm sure, some figures from the all Africa perspective itself. But, I mean, we, we have just had um, about uh, a month ago a meeting with East African and Central African uh, uh, media owners. And one of the key discussions we had is about how can we at AMI help them create new revenues and services to actually deliver more news and information on mobile platform, mobile phones, but also news gathering from those, because those two go together. Now, we, we, you know, I can give you complex examples. Of course, the easiest ones would be in countries like South Africa, Ghana, Nigeria, Senegal, or, or, or Kenya, where I live. Um, but the reality is it's growing in that direction more and more, and it's, there's no going back. One of the best indicators is to look at what the telecommunications companies are doing. If you look at throughout the continent, all telecommunications agencies are actually investing more and more in content as opposed to voice, simply because the voice is going down more and more in their revenue models, and content is growing. And actually, it is said that MTN, for instance, has the largest newsrooms in building on the continent, which would be in Uganda. I've never seen it. I don't know about it, but that's what he said. So to answer your question, that's right. But just if I may just comment on what uh, um, um, uh, Jerry uh, mentioned earlier. It's true that many of the media news organizations are struggling in Africa. Uh, but interestingly enough, if you look at the latest report from One IFRA, the World Association of Newspapers, the only space, the only place where you have newspapers, and I'm talking here specifically about newspapers, growing, and this may be in contradiction with what I said earlier, is Southeast Asia in Africa. You know, so what it means is, but you can also explain that, why are these newspapers growing? Well, you know, sustained economic growth is one. Second is the emergence more and more of a you know, middle class. And third is education also, you know, shooting up. So, you know, newspapers going from a low basis tend to benefit from that. But so at the same time, everybody getting, having a cell phone makes it like you can widen the audience, really. Take one, take one from the back here. Thank you. Oh, it's uh, Joe. Yeah, I agree. Um, I was wondering. Please what, introduce yourself, Joe, please. I'm Joe Davidson. And I write for the Washington Post. Um, I was wondering what is the status of uh, a cross platform uh, journalism training in Africa? Uh, Mr. 
today here, everything has to be multimedia, print, web, uh, video, online, photo galleries. I'm just wondering uh, to what extent is that uh, type of training available for journalism students in Africa? And you can add to what I say. Uh, Joe failed to say that he also is a former correspondent in South Africa uh, um, for, the, for the Wall Street Journal. When I was covering for, uh, for the Baltimore Sun, Joe was a, a correspondent in, in South Africa for the Wall Street Journal. So he's another member of the, the club of, of those of us who, uh, who, who have watched South Africa for many years. Um, Cross-platform training, uh, more and more, I, I, all of the Newspapers, news organizations that are that are um, that are trying to be vibrant, trying to stay with the times, and there are a lot that are trying. Um, uh, have have uh, websites. Have uh, have uh, you? If you look at any Nigerian newspaper, if, certainly if you look at any of the South African or the Kenyan newspapers, they have websites. They do television. They do radio. On, they have an online presence and as well as uh, a physical presence. Um, and uh, and more and more journalists are trained to um, to to do things like that, and they're also to, to do uh, multimedia reporting. But they're all and they're also trained to do things like uh, um, there's a there's a big movement to to um, to do data uh, journalism across the continent to to learn to if not scrape data work with data scrapers and people who can get in the kinds of information that that um, Give more, lend more credibility to, to news stories. So, so multimedia training, data training. There's a there's a good deal of it going on across the continent, especially in communities that have the wherewithal to do it. And I think that uh, Amadou is right about newspapers growing in large part because economies across the continent are better. But 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 there is a concentration of really big newspapers that account for really big, really powerful. Newspaper groups, they're not just individual newspaper groups, and they're not just newspapers, but they're media companies that I think account for and, and, and the growth, a large part of the growth, and you can correct me, but a large large part of the, the growth in readership. And also, um, I should say a word about radio still being the way that most people on the continent get most of their information. I mean, mobile is through the roof. It's growing. Everybody has a cell phone, or two or three, as in some of the cases of people I know in some countries in Nigeria. Everybody I know in Nigeria has three cell phones. Um, but, uh, but people still get most of their information from radio on the continent. And in cases where people have smartphones, they might get their radio through their cell, phone, their cell phones. Uh, but, but radio remains an incredibly uh, uh, an important um, uh, vehicle for getting information for most people. Oh, on, on that, on, on that, I mean, maybe you guys can guess what is the the app actually which is most downloaded on the continent. That's the FM radio. That's the most widely downloaded app. Now, the thing is, even on feature phones like the simple Nokia stuff, you can listen an FM radio, you know, on it. And that's also what really makes a huge change, actually, on the continent. And I always tell my friends in the news organization, look, those who have newspapers, even in big cities like Nairobi, I mean, big countries like Kenya, I mean, the, the Daily Nation, which is a great paper, is out every day. And you can, actually, you can have it from around 11 p.m. midnight. You can buy the Daily, news, uh, Daily Nation from the next day. A week later, it's not in the remotest parts of the country. Of course, you would expect that, because, you know, why do that? But those folks in those remotest areas have cell phones. And of course, you cannot replace, you know, all the content from the newspaper onto the cell phone. But you can get them participate somehow in to the national debate. And that's actually one of the things we're doing with, with ICFJ, is, um, you know, uh, really trying to do what we call innovation and digital adaptation. Uh, we launched last year the largest um, competition on the continent, which is a million dollar competi competition. So every year, we, and this is called the African News Innovation Challenge. We give about a million dollar prize to different news organizations. 
for the, to, to, to help them actually just innovate. And last year we have about 533 applications for that African News Innovation Challenge. Out of those, 533, and this is from Africa. Out of those, we had about 40, which was really great ideas. And out of those 40 great ideas, there was about 20 which we rewarded. And you know, the, 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 the great things in this is we don't only give the rewards or stuff. We bring them together and we try to improve what they're doing and we try also to replicate it. One of the you know, heart-wrenching actually experiences was in Kenya last year around data journalism, which is linked to this. We brought in uh, you know, a young lady who is working in you know, an unknown news organization actually, radio, uh, radio and TV. And you know, there was a pattern and this pattern was in this part of the country, when girls are 10 to 13, they tend to drop out of school and nobody sees them. You know, they, even if they were good, they're really, I mean, it really goes wrong, completely wrong. And everybody has been trying to find the reason why. And it was very simple, of course, but nobody could find it until we did this data boot camp with some of the winners of ANIC. And the, the, the simple, reason why there was a dropout is at that age, young girls start to menstruate. And of course, in those schools, there was no sanitary, proper sanitary or adequate sanitary uh, infrastructure. Boys and girls mixed up. And then, you know, they would start having self-consciousness issues and then they will drop out of school. But thanks to data journalism and thanks to using these technologies, you know, a young girl I'm sure a boy could have done the same too, but a young girl in this instance found the reason why, and it was fixed by the community and the local government, you know, fixed the problem. So this is actually also, from my perspective, why journalism, good journalism for that matter, quality journalism, using the new information and communication technologies is critical, because it's not only about fighting against the government, whatever, whenever, whatever that happens. It's about solving the real critical needs of people at the grassroots level, levels. Can I talk about one of, your, one of his other successes? Would that be okay? Very quickly, yes. uh, very quickly. Um, one of the winners of this, uh, another, uh, one of the winners of, of, of the competition that Amadou just mentioned uh, was um, a Mozambican newspaper which collaborated with a, a Center for uh, Investigative Journalism in Mozambique. And their project, winning project, was to build a platform, a citizen desk, a platform where citizens could basically follow the progress of the election campaign in Mozambique and contribute to the dialogue about what was going on in their communities, what was going on in terms of voter registration, what was going, what were, where, the, where, the, where the registration, where the facilities weren't working, where something is wrong. The, there, uh, 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 200 journalists were trained and, and a number, professional journalists, and then a whole cadre of core of citizen journalists were trained to report on the happenings in their communities it, leading up to the, the election, which I think is in November. And um, uh, reports from my, my friends on the ground there say it is an absolutely phenomenal thing. No Mozambican uh, election has ever been covered in this way where the kinds of information that is coming from communities all over the continent, uh, all over the country, um, it, it, th that kind of information is available on this platform that was built with funding from this challenge that uh, Amadou's organization sponsored and that we work with them on. Another question. All right, here's one. Hi, uh, Leon Morse with IREX, where I manage our Media Sustainability Index. And uh, I mention that because um, in my work, I compare South Africa with a lot of, uh, with 41 other countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. And compared to its neighbors, South Africa has some huge um, financial and human resource advantages. Um, and so I'm wondering, uh, based on you know, some of the recommendations in the report, what, what kind of value added could, can foreign donors provide to the South African media sector that the South African media sector at large can't already provide to its colleagues and to itself generally? 
I mean, I, I don't disagree with some of the lingering challenges that were presented. I just want to make that clear. But you know, in terms of donors versus internal. Okay, Libby, do you want to comment on that? Um, yes, I mean, we do have very big media organizations. And I think the easiest way, in a way, to answer that is to look at whether, if the Weekly Mail, as it was then, had not managed to form the partnerships that it did in order to survive, and it had closed down like the others did, I think that we would not have the level of investigative journalism in some of the big mainstream media. I think they've set a standard, even though they're a small paper that has challenged some of those big media. Now, those big media are not going to help to fund their competition. Um, in a way, they do. One of the big advantages we've got is a, our government recognized very early on, I mean, even before the first elections, they said that to make media freedom real, rather than just a right that carries on being for those that are most privileged, you actually need government to set up a fund um, to support small media. And we've got that, a media development and diversity agency. It funds small community media, those sorts of media. And after a lot of um, pressure on, and threats that they might face taxes on their advertising revenue, the big mainstream media do give some funding. Um, and they are, they're very big, but the same as anywhere else, I think that they, what you've got is less journalists in even those big media groups doing more. They're not only having to write the daily story, they're now also having to update like a radio station, they're having to tweet, and they're having to do audiovisual media. And inevitably, that means that the, the quality and depth of information suffers. Um, people rely more and more on Twitter to reflect what the country feels. Only a tiny percentage of people are on Twitter. So I think it is a complex issue, but it's how do we, in a way, support media, and it's not necessarily going to happen on its own from within those big media organizations. They run by entities that are not owning media to increase information. Often they run by organizations that want to increase shareholders' profits. But how do we, even in small ways, set the standard in the way that the Mail and Guardian does that challenges them to do more? Um, I hope that vaguely answers the question. Dave, you want to come in? <clears throat> Sure. Well, I would have to agree with you. Uh, you know, for the endowment, we made that exact judgment that uh, the media in uh, South Africa was in pretty good shape. And uh, certainly relative to uh, other countries in Africa, uh, you know, the needs were much greater uh, elsewhere. So, uh, you know, it's not to say that uh, the South African media Need, could use some improvement here and there, but uh, I think the needs are simply much greater in uh, some other parts of the continent. Yeah. Um, uh, thank you, Reid. Um, you know, I, I actually agree with the fact that the South African media is in pretty good shape, but we really ought to be very careful about it because actually, you know, I know many uh, in South Africa, in the media landscape today, who are very concerned about where it is. And obviously, I think what Libby is saying is totally true, and that's why it needs to be uh, tackled head on, which is the interest of the owners versus the interest of the citizens. You know, the interest of quality journalism versus the interest of the owners. And, and to that effect, actually, you know, I just want to reiterate something which we all know. Quality journalism costs money and costs a lot of money. Now, one of the answers we're trying to bring at AMI, uh, with, with uh, many of our partners, including ICFJ, is, you know, something we call answer. Answer is A-N-C-R-N, A-C-I-R. Uh, South Africans pronounce it anchor. Uh, but basically, it's an uh, African network for centers of investigative uh, reporting. Basically, what we're doing is creating a backbone, an infrastructure for investigative journalism, so that news organizations around the continent do not necessarily have to invest in this very heavy, you know, um, in, uh, heavy infrastructure in terms of doing forensic uh, 
forensic um, investigative journalism and trying to work cross borders extra. We take care of that as AMI. We create the network and we're starting with about 15 news, news, newsrooms from around the continent, east, west, north, center, and southern Africa, so that we give them the infrastructure they need and the heavy investment they need to actually start doing good quality journalism around investigative journalism. And I think that would, at some point, make a difference so that we're not just giving it to one news organization or two in a country, but we create the network around the continent so that they can be working together. And I think that's absolutely important. And then, yeah, and that's donor, donor funded. You're, well, you're able that, to... that's donor funded in part, and the other part is the money we raise from our own members to complement it. Another point uh, I think uh, was very interesting in, in Libby's report, in fact, to some extent it seemed to be sort of generated by the Freedom House uh, ranking, which has actually downgraded South Africa from uh, you know, free to, I don't know, uh, a two or something. You know, there's a slight downgrade. And I found her analysis of that uh, extremely interesting. I, I really recommend it uh, um, because it seems that a lot of the problem is some of the new legislation that uh, has been proposed in South Africa. Obviously, uh, the um, uh, you know, Security uh, Act, uh, I can't remember the name, that, that would make it um, uh, more difficult for journalists. What, what's interesting is the extent to which the court system in South Africa has really resisted that. Uh, and uh, it would seem that, you know, again, from Libby's report that uh, I don't know if the Freedom House uh, downgrading is really justified. It, it would seem that, uh, in fact, uh, you know, despite uh, what the government is trying to do, the South African press is really uh, fighting a pretty uh, good fight there and, and uh, maintaining uh, its, its freedom. You had a question right here? Uh, there is a, a sort of a dual. There's sort of a, uh, I'm Charles Self from the uh, University of Oklahoma. Uh, there is sort of a dual objective in creating uh, a consolidation of democracy in Africa, it seems to me. On the one hand, uh, trying to improve the quality of information coming through journalism, and on the other hand, trying to empower voices that have been ignored in the past. Uh, much of the discussion, particularly in the presentation, has focused on funding news organizations, which are provide good quality information. But right here at the end, we were talking about uh, the growing citizen movement using new media and uh, actually participating in the discussion rather than passively receiving information from news organizations. I wonder to what extent uh, funding donors are fund, are, see their role as funding organizations, or to what extent do we see funding flowing into citizen initiatives of one kind or another, perhaps through digital media and other forms? Uh, I guess the thrust of our discussion seems to be on organizations. I wonder if there's any shift taking place now, or if it should. Can any of you answer? Okay. I can't talk of, about donors across the board, but I can certainly say that, um, that there is an incredible interest in empowering citizens, giving citizens voices, because um, it's, it's been widely recognized that, uh, that, first of all, most of these media organization or organizations are urban-centered, and it, people in remote, more remote areas, even though they are more connected now than they ever have been, don't, often don't have a, a, a real voice in um, the, the major dialogues going on about important issues in their lives. So, so almost every program that we have done at inter the International Center for journalists um, in the last couple of years has had some uh, component that, that involves uh, citizen engagement and uh, you know finding tools and, and ways to ensure that citizens are engaged in whatever the production of media of news is in, in a given place. Or in, in training cores of uh, citizen networks of citizen journalists. Um, for instance, in the Niger Delta, we've got a specific program 
where we are where we are working with citizens throughout the Delta, which is very underrepresented in, in the media in Nigeria, um, to, uh, to use mobile phones to, to, uh, to send information out um, uh, on, they've created a blog where they've send it, they send information out about what's, a blog page about what's happening in their communities in the Delta and on, in environmental issues, on health issues, uh, and, and, and many of um, their reports are being picked up by mainstream newspapers, so, it's, so, so their, their news and information is being incorporated into the, the wider dialogue. So that's, that's a really important trend that's, that's taking place um, across, certainly across the continent, and in the, devel the developing world, I think. To the back here. Can you stand up so we can see you and give, give your name, please? Uh, I'm Bohendo Mema. I'm an international student from the Congo. I'd like to know to what extent does, uh, does SADC uh, safeguard media freedom within the region? And has there been cases where uh, SADC itself has intervened in countries where uh, the media has been sus suppressed and in cases where uh, investigative journalism has uncovered uh, massive corruption in governments. Thanks. So can anyone on the panel speak to the role of the Southern African Development Community, yeah. SADC? Well, yeah, yeah, I mean, if I may just speak more broadly about it, SADC, but not only SADC, uh, all RECs really, the regional economic communities, because the reality is, you know, even if you take the AU, and you take one of the mechanisms of the AU, which is the NEPAD, the New Economic Partnership for uh, uh, Development in Africa, uh, NEPAD. I mean, all of those RECs have in their constitution a dimension around media, you know, freedom of expression, uh, freedom of the press, extra. Actually, one of the criteria for the peer review mechanism was the, uh, the degree of freedom of press in the countries. Now, of course, there's a big challenge around that because we, 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 we're not fighting, but engaging the AU and, uh, uh, on this topic specifically because it was there at the beginning. A couple of years later, it was dropped without them saying anybody. So now we're trying to bring it back there. Um, but on SADC, I worked personally, I worked with SADC on two issues. Um, one of them is resolved. Uh, one is not resolved yet uh, because you know, I am a proponent and a strong believer of using the telephone as opposed to the megaphone when you're dealing with issues related to press freedom on the continent. It is important to have organizations which are demonstrating and doing all the you know, big noise, which is good. But at the end of the day, you ought to have what I call a constructive engagement with the governments. And that very often you don't and you cannot have it necessarily when you're on the street demonstrating. I mean, just for full disclosure here, uh, I'm being you know, targeted a lot currently because at the, in November this year, we are doing our annual meeting, the African Media Leaders Forum in Ethiopia. Now, of course, Ethiopia, everybody knows the challenges we have in Ethiopia. And many of my good friends outside of the continent mostly are telling me, well, you know, you ought not to go to Ethiopia because of this and that. And they have some good reasons they put forward. But the reality is, if you don't go to Ethiopia, if you don't engage with the Ethiopian government, or what any other government for that matter, you would not resolve some of the very, you know, heartbreaking cases you have in those countries. So SADC is doing some very good work with it, and we partner, we partner with SADC occasionally. We do the same with ECOWAS, and we also engage AU whenever you know, we really have cause to do that. One last question. All right, keep, if we... We got permission to take one more here. There's somebody's hand I can see there. All right. Indignaki. Indignaki. 
Thank you very much. Dimiaki Mokaliere, Voice of America. Just wondering if you could comment on um, the role of media, especially during important and critical developments, say elections, and in light of two very important elections happening next week, Zimbabwe and Mali, and when you talk about foreign funding and how they influence, uh, how they can influence uh, the direction of a paper, and then also when you talk about the interests, obviously government control papers serve government interest, independent, um, independently funded papers maybe serve the interest, interest of the opposition or the party. So can you just maybe weigh in on those, um, on that particular aspect with, uh, with a specific um, uh, reference to Mali and Zimbabwe next week? Thank you. You want to start, and uh, we'll ask everybody to comment. Yeah. Okay. Well, well, I, I, I can share with you uh, a recent example. Um, you know, I I believe that at, at a certain you know at some point, uh, media development organizations on the continent just have to refuse to go into some projects. Like now, if you look at the situation in Zimbabwe and in Mali, of course, leading towards really critical elections, uh, we were engaged by uh, a, a interna an international organization in Paris. Uh, many would know which one is that. Not many in there, not UNESCO. Um, to do actually training for the elections coming up, elections in Mali. Now, of course, you know, this goes back to what was said earlier. I think training is important, but why would we just go and do specific training for the upcoming elections in Mali? You know, I don't believe in that. I believe like you know, when, when you can build a program around training. Now, it is also very critical because in this case, the international organization which were, came to us unsolicited to give us the, uh, the funding to conduct this training obviously has an interest in the country. We could have gone and do that, done that, and it's not a bad interest really because they're not necessarily, you know, I mean, it's, this is an international organization, so they're owned by governments. Um, but I think at the end of the day, it's always good to have a, a holistic view if you're working in this area. Now, when it comes to Zimbabwe, of course it's much more divisive and, and much more complex. Uh, the reality is even the good media, I know that, pub, uh, private and independent, some owned by my, some of my very good friends, I mean, they're doing a fantastic job, but some of their funding, true, uh, comes from foreign donors. But you know what? People see them are, I, I'm not inventing this, quote unquote, CIA agents. I mean, to the point that we have refused, actually we haven't refused, he has suggested us not to do, as army, not to do a workshop in Zimbabwe with a certain donor because then it would just crystallize the fact that they're seen as CIA agents. So, you know, it's, it's very complex to do. These, these things are very complex. But at the end of the day, what I believe in is, um, you know, keep engaging both with governments and citizens, organized groups, so that the media can find a place of itself in which it can develop. Because what has been happening so far, mostly and unfortunately, is the media has been in its, in its ivory tower where it tends to be doing itself by itself no, without, uh, you know, collaboratively and without really talking about it and engaging who they may view as the bad guys. But at the end of the day, you know, there's, you know yes, there are some bad guys, but it's always good to engage. <clears throat> sure. Uh, sure. I mean, in the case of Mali, um, the, uh, of course, Mali had the reputation in Africa as being one of the freest uh, presses uh, on the continent. And, uh, you know, after the coup, uh, that all disappeared. Uh, the um, uh, endowment recently made a grant to the Maison de la Presse in, in Mali. They argued that. Uh, you know, they had lost all of their funding, uh, for the, much of it was coming from uh, the state, 
uh, and that uh, compared to the foreign journalists that were coming into the country, you know, uh, they you know, were really under-resourced. They were kind of stuck in Bamako and uh, were not able to cover uh, the fighting that was going on or, you know, any of the problems uh, uh, in the country. And, and so, uh, you know, we made a small grant uh, for them to be able to set up a, an office up in the north and uh, improve their coverage. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, I think uh, that's kind of the story for us uh, in Mali. In the case of Zimbabwe, uh, you know, as I was suggesting, uh, the Mass Public Opinion Institute had shown some, uh, you know, elections ago that uh, indeed uh, the government's dominance of the airways really was the decisive factor in uh, them being able to win uh, in, in previous elections. This time around, it's a very different sort of media environment, you know, between all the cell phones and the radio broadcasts and the uh, television, even the printed press now. Uh, you know, it's difficult to say whether in the end it's going to make uh, a significant difference, but it certainly is a very different media environment today in Zimbabwe than it was uh, during the last elections. Last word, DJ. Uh, just a general last word. Um, I think when you've got any country where the media have, been, where the media climate is difficult, where the press has been embattled, when much of your most most professional journal, any of your pro most professional journalists have had to leave the country or are in exile, and then you you face a big uh, important event like an election, media me the media community is not well prepared to play its proper role in in covering that election. So so my general feeling is that any assistance that can come from outside that will assist them in playing that role. Is, 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 is good. I recognize what Amadou has said about uh, how support from outside can be viewed. But um, when you have a community in this kind of crisis, uh, they're not able to do it themselves. Help has to come from somewhere. And uh, it's better if that help can come not the month before the election as a single workshop. It, it is better if, um, if uh, you work six months in advance or more um, very often we've had night fellows uh, who have gone into a place a year ahead and done sort of not sort of coverage on how to, how to cover politics and elections and in an ethical and professional way and, and, and you don't want to drop it on them at the last minute but I, I, I generally believe that uh, that um, and, and by the way we've got one of our night fellows Brenda Wilson who has done who has done specific training in South Africa as she has done elsewhere around the, um, the continent and, and in the world, really, uh, in, in this kind of situation. But um, I, I feel like the support from outside is, is absolutely essential when the need is there and when the support isn't going to come from inside. But certainly better, better, better to take a long view than to do it at the last minute. Well, thank you all for coming and participating. Thank the uh, Center for organizing this and giving us a chance to discuss an issue that clearly, for those of us on the panel, is, is near and dear and one we could keep on going on. Uh, but uh, there will be other opportunities. Uh, so at this time, we will close. Thank you. <laughs>